what I wanted to do is to talk about the beginning of the English Revolution and, and go to, uh, I guess, where um, where Charles is uh, beheaded. Okay, so this is, this is quite a thing in English history. Uh, the first and only, the first and only uh, king in British history to be executed for treason. Um, <clears throat> uh, and creates a, a big turning point, not only for England, but even for Europe as a whole. To, to think that a parliament could do such a thing. Okay, it really, really undermines the notion of what a monarch is in the traditional sense. Now, I'm looking at the English Revolution as the period from 1640 to 1701. That is not uh, the standard way of looking at things, uh, but I think this is this is, you know, the way that I like to think about history in this long durée sort of fashion, and also from a Marxist perspective, because we're thinking about class warfare, and, uh, and and in this case, the the Parliament, which consisted of the House of Lords, which were nobles, so they're lords, they're part of the peerage. That's what allows them to be. Uh, in the House of Lords, who are politicians and are interested in governance. Not all nobles are interested, right? Um, but, um, and, then, and then the House of Commons, who's made up of relatively wealthy people who are primarily not nobles. Some of them are, but most of them not, because they could otherwise be part of the House of Lords, which is the higher chamber. But, um, but wealthy uh, and relatively powerful people who are not nobility could be part of the commons. And so they're gaining class consciousness um, as a class uh, fighting back against the power of the monarchy. And, um, and this first phase is, is quite dramatic. So in 1640, Charles calls Parliament back. So he had ruled for 11 years with no Parliament. He gets himself into the Bishop's War with the Presbyterians in Scotland. And now he needs to raise an army. He needs money and he needs the support of Parliament in order to mobilize an army and get everybody riled up and ready to do this. And uh, so he calls a new parliament. It has dissolved the previous parliament from 11 years ago. So there's new elections. They arrive in 1640 and um, and the parliament is, starts voicing concerns about the Irish army that's being raised by Charles through Wentworth uh, to invade Scotland. Doesn't sound good having a Catholic army invade Protestant Scotland to the parliament who is largely, um, well, they're at least Anglican for the most part. And then even Puritans who are more radically against Catholic than the Anglicans. And what Parliament decides to do is to raise their own army to defend, uh, well, well, to fight the Bishop's War, um, but then perhaps to fight off the Irish army, right? So they have control of this army. Charles goes ahead and raises his own army uh, using prerogatives of the crown and <clears throat> continuing to do things like he did during his, uh, his personal rule, absolute monarchy rule. And, um, and of course, as I mentioned before, Scottish, the Scottish parliament, they have their own parliament uh, that parlays with the king um, separately. Uh, they're, they're raising their own army as well to defend themselves against the Irish army, which makes a lot of sense. 
Uh, but now the Parliament Army and the, the Scottish Army, Presbyterian Army, are likely to be allies. And then, so now you have two large armies with sort of four different, uh, each having two different branches uh, that are amassing. This breaks out into the English Civil War, uh, quite uh, predictably. Um, now, uh, you know, I say the English Revolution, some people refer to the English Civil War, like the first phase of the English Civil Wars as, as the English Revolution. Some refer to the Glorious Revolution, that will be the last part of what I consider the revolution. Um, so I'm looking again at this long durée kind of thing. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so we have, you know, these civil wars between these two factions, uh, as, as I suggested, that's what works out. Uh, in the midst of this, there is the peace of Westphalia. So that's the end of the 30 years war on the continent. England is largely uh, kept, um, has largely kept out of this, but, um, but the continent has been through a 30 year war that is the, the, the most devastating war uh, you know, on record, you know, and some of this has to do with technology like Scheidler discusses, um, as the technology advances, the wars get more brutal. And, um, and so the peace of Westphalia is the peace treaty at the end of the 30 year wars amongst multiple parties. And many people consider this the birth of the modern nation state. Uh, because it establishes a peace be, uh, amongst all the various parties, uh, but also stipulates an agreement that the territories uh, and the borders as they stand are inviolable, that, that all the, the parties to the treaty are not to violate the borders of the other parties. And this tends to stabilize uh, the borders within on the continent and allow these independent states within these borders to develop um, in relative, uh, relative peace, um, which you know doesn't entirely work out, but there's some principles laid down in the language and the way uh, the integrity of a territory is considered that it that if it is independent, then it should be treated more on the level of what only an empire would be treated in the past. Uh, you know, the the sort of trading of small provinces was part of the the play in the previous centuries, and, and it didn't seem it wasn't considered a major violation. Now even small states were considered inviolable that you really were uh, creating an act of major aggression to go even against a small state. <clears throat> and, and sort of implicit in that is that there could be large alliances to come to the aid of a, of a smaller state. So, um, so it, it starts to create the sort of stability that we see in the coming centuries, which is not entirely stable, but better than what it had been previous to this. Okay. Um, but on the continent, Most of the states there, even the Republic of the Netherlands that we saw established in the previous century before this, um, although it was a republic, it doesn't seem like the modern nation state is fully hatched, you know? And the English Revolution is kind of um, a big step in the direction of, of making uh, the modern sort of nation uh, what it is, because they they dramatically 
uh, redefine what a monarch is. And so it provides a path for all sorts of nations to get out of absolute monarchy, which is just you know, part of the chaos of the past before this. Uh, in the midst of the English Civil Wars, uh, the New Model Army is founded. So this is the army on a new model. And so uh, it's the first standing professional army in England and, and now will just become a permanent feature uh, of, of England, which up until this point, they did not have a standing army. They would call up armies as needed and then people would go back and into their civilian lives. Here we have permanent, army officers who are professional soldiers that's all they've ever done that's all they know and they're just waiting for the next conflict uh, in uh, in the new model army there is a group called the agitators um, in 1647 they're sort of uh, lower ranking officers who come to the high ranking officers, the council of officers and present complaints from the rank and file uh, of the new model army. And a lot of this is that they want rights uh, for uh, religious tolerance and they also wanna be paid. Uh, notoriously, the new model army is, is, is in arrears on payment. So soldiers are always being owed money uh, uh, and, and they're not quite sure when they're going to get paid or if they're going to get paid, and it undermines the morale. <clears throat> this group of agitators called levelers, sort of on the model of those levelers that I discussed earlier, um, you know, rabble rousers, uh, occupiers, um, people who are trying to assert rights uh, beyond you know, their legal standing, uh, these so-called levelers uh, drop an agreement of the people uh, that, that lays out as a manifesto, the sorts of rights that they want for soldiers, including religious freedom and regular pay and the right to air grievances um, and the part of it is also to build these things into the constitution, into the legal framework of, of the new government that is going to be founded when they win the war against Charles. So the new model army is looking ahead to when they'll defeat Charles and then there's gonna be a new regime without the king and they want to get these principles into law right at the beginning of this new form of government. <clears throat> so they have the Putney debates, uh, the levelers or uh, agitators are arguing against the grandees. The grandees are the leading officers in the new model army, which are some nobles and some landed gentry who, um, who are the highest officers uh, in the army. And they're a lot more conservative and uh, the Putney debates is all about this notion of a new constitution uh, for the coming government. In the midst of these controversies, we have the Cork Bush uh, field mutiny, uh, largely about back pay. Um, and here, uh, uh, the heads of proposals has been published, which is a response to the agreement of the people. And the heads of proposals is the document that's favored by the grandees. And the agreement of the people is that favored by the agitators within the army. So this is part of the Corkbush uh, mutiny. And um, uh, Fairfax, who is the Supreme Commander of the New Model Army, army wants uh, soldiers to swear an oath of allegiance to him personally. And so they're, they're disagreeing with that. And uh, their slogan of the, of the mutiny is England's freedom, soldiers' rights. So we fight for England, England's freedom. You give us as soldiers our rights uh, in repayment for that in this form of a, a new constitution, a new form of government. Um,
not too long in the next year, we have uh, Pride's Purge. This is a purge of parliament. <clears throat> so in the House of Lords, especially, there were many royalists who were really in support of Charles coming, uh, of Charles uh, remaining on the throne. And um, now Charles has fled into exile at this point in the civil wars. Um, but they want to bring back Charles. They want to see some way of bringing back Charles and maybe reigning in his absolute power. Um, but they're still in favor of monarchy. Um, you know, the House of Lords made up of nobles, uh, you know, they could be many of them related to King Charles and, um, and have all sort of social ties, of course, to the monarchy in different ways. <clears throat> and being closest to the monarchy, you know, they feel threatened, of course, by the, the revolution. Uh, but the grandees, the leaders of the new model army, have no intention of bringing Charles back and putting him on the throne. They want to try him for treason. And they're not going to take it from the royalists who want some sort of compromise solution to everything. So they launch a coup d'etat. Um, they prevent members of parliament from entering chambers, uh, largely the House of Lords. Um, they arrest 45 members. And, and that's it. Those, those members that were excluded, or as they called it, secluded, um, they're just not allowed back into parliament. So parliament has changed. Uh, and now you just have the rump parliament. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention here, that's really important, um, is that the long parliament, when it comes into session and Charles is trying to raise funds for the bishops war, uh, first order of business for, for them was that they they passed an act <clears throat> and they weren't going to discuss any bishops war until this got passed that um, parliament cannot be dissolved without its own consent so no dissolving of parliament on the arbitrary whim of Charles or any other monarch from here on out parliament can only be dissolved with its own consent. If there's a good reason to do it and have a new election, okay, but we're not gonna just allow the monarch to say, oh, you guys are dissolved. Uh, that's why it's called the long parliament because it decides not to dissolve itself uh, until 1660. But with Pride's Purge, the new model army just does a military coup d'etat and, and cuts off all the people that disagree with their position of trying Charles for treason and what is left of the rump parliament, the, like the remnant um, of the parliament. Uh, there's no House of Lords anymore, and there's just the House of Commons uh, made up of whomever the new model army uh, grandees decided was uh, a legitimate member of, of parliament. Um, uh, they pass an act quickly prohibiting the proclamation of any person to be king of England. Uh, and then, um, uh, of course, what prompted all this was that Charles had been captured uh, in, in the civil wars and uh, they had Charles in custody and they wanted to try him for, for treason. And so they create the rump parliament, they push through the, the trial for treason against the parliament. Now, this is what's interesting is treason traditionally was considered treason against the monarch, but how could Charles commit treason against himself? But they're trying him for treason against parliament, a, a novel, new idea. Uh, and so they push that through, you know, through this coup d'etat uh, sort of action um, which probably wouldn't have happened if the House of Lords had re remained seated. Um, they behead Charles in, on January 30th. And, um, and so Charles II, his son, um, is next in line to the throne. Uh, he is supported by the Scottish engagers. Uh, so these are members of the Scottish parliament that um, are engaged with the king and uh, our royalists. 
And so they, they end up voting to proclaim uh, Charles II King uh, of, of Scotland uh, on the condition that he agreed to Presbyterian church government governance. That was the whole issue of the Bishop's War. So if they could resolve that with Charles II, then the whole issue is resolved and, and they're satisfied. <clears throat> but um, the English parliament in England, not Scotland, does not accept Charles. And what they do is they form the Commonwealth and so this Commonwealth is a new form of government, like the uh, agreement of the people was, was asking for, um, but, um, but ultimately has formed along lines that are uh, more in line with the heads of proposals of the grandees rather than the agreement of the people of the levelers. Okay, but, um, but the, there is, this is a, a big, this is a big progress in the direction of something that looks more like what we consider a democracy, like, like an American style democracy. Okay, so we'll, we'll see about that in the next video.